Okay, so welcome to the last event of this Quantum Summer Summit. I'm Tu Chie Wei. I'm uh, hosting this panel discussion on quantum ready workforce. So let me just give you some brief uh, statement of this panel. Uh, I just read what I put on the website. So just to give the audience the background, uh, quantum information science and Technology, as you have witnessed, evolved rapidly over the past few decades, uh, leading to quantum processes with as many as about order 100 qubit or even more. Related research originated from a small scientific community that has grown to a multidisciplinary field of its own, namely the quantum information science, the demand from research institutions national lab and industries is fast growing. How can we train the next quantum ready workforce? This is the topic of this panel. The National Science and Technology Council published a report on national strategic overview for quantum information science that also emphasizes creating a quantum smart workforce for tomorrow. So the current educational system with discrete disciplinary tracks may not be suitable for training a workforce with a broad range of necessary expertise, physics, information, computer science, and engineering. This panel will discuss various ideas, questions, and issues concerning a quantum ready workforce. So today we have a very exciting panel with experts from several related areas. Let me introduce the panel and the organizer asked me also to read a brief bio of each of the panelists. So let me start um, from the lab. We have Professor Robert Join. He's a professor in the Department of Physics, University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Bob received his PhD from the University of Maryland in 82 and spent some time at Cambridge and ETH Zurich before joining Wisconsin. He is currently associate chair of the Department of Physics and the founding director of the MS program in physics quantum computing. He's a senior fellow at the Kevali Institute for Theoretical Sciences at the Institute of Physics in Beijing. His research has ranged from quantum Hall effect to high TC superconductivity to neutron stars and to quantum computing. Welcome, Bob. Next, Vadimir Korapin. Professor at CNYAN Institute for Theoretical Physics, Stony Brook University. Uh, Vladimir is a recipient of SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research and Scholarly Activity. His current research centers on quantum dynamics, data ansatz, and how low depth uh, and low depth quantum search. He has fundamental results on quantization of Einstein, gravity, and also in entanglement in spin chains. He organized multiple conferences on quantum information. I remember myself attending one when I was a PhD student and another one when I was postdoc. So I benefit from the activity that he organized. Next, we have Bonita London. Bonita is a professor of social and health psychology in the Department of Psychology. Uh, he is also the director of the social processes of identity, coping, and engagement research lab, leading research in social personality and educational psychology in an identity, achievement, and institutional culture. She has helped design also a workforce development plan for a multi-institutional quantum project. She's currently on the road today, unfortunately, but has recorded a clip on the overview of her work on the workflow development plan, which I'll play at some point of our panel discussion. Next is Dr. James Misovich, who is currently a social lab director for basic energy sciences, Brookhaven National Lab. So Jim earned his PhD from Cornell University in 84 in physical chemistry. Before joining BNL, he spent a few years at IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights. 
He was the main force that helped to win the award of the Co-Design Center of Quant Advantage, which is a large collaboration led by BNL. Next, we have C.R. Ramakrishna, who is a professor in Computer Science Department at Stony Brook University. Uh, CR's main areas of research are computational logic, formal methods, knowledge representation, and distributed quantum computing. His research, recent, re, recent work has been on algorithm for efficient entanglement distribution in quantum computations and on distributing computation over network quantum computer. He is the current graduate program director of computer science. Finally, we have Dr. Mark Reeder, who is chair of the Physical Sciences Council at IBM Research, which supports basic physical science research in IBM's Zurich, Yorktown, and Amadon labs. The IBM Quantum Experience was launched by a group he led in May of 2016, allowing users to access and program by Cuba quantum computer process from the cloud. I myself also benefit that. Uh, Mark has been an active advocate of quantum science funding in the US. He's a member of the National Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee and served on the first governing board of the Quantum Economic Development and Consortium. So I welcome all the panelists. Just as a reminder uh, to other participants, in the panel, uh, we ask that you place your question in the chat. And if you want a specific panelist to answer the question, please also put his or her name. It, it is more preferable for you to put in the chat because then all the panelists will be able to read them. However, if you cannot put in the chat, you could, you, you're welcome also to, to um, raise hand and, and then speak out your question. So uh, with the introduction, so let me maybe start with a, a question to all the panelists. Uh, I'll just like warm up and just ask, what do you do in your everyday job that is related to quantum? So this is a question to, to all the panelists. So let me uh, stop sharing the slide, maybe we, uh, begin with Bob. Uh, what do I do that's related to quantum? Uh, well, uh, as you said, you know, I direct the uh, quantum computers master's program here at Wisconsin. Uh, so uh, what I'm doing, at least in that part of my job, is, uh, is educating master's students uh, for the, uh, what we believe is a growing marketplace for master's students uh, in uh, the quantum workforce. Uh, so I spent a lot of time thinking about what exactly are going to be the useful skills uh, that they're going to need to have for uh, the quantum workforce. And um, related to that is talking to employers, pers prospective employers, uh, what is it they think they're going to need. Um, and uh, very often um, what they're looking for is a combination of technical skills, uh, the actual uh, technical part of quantum computing or quantum information science and uh, other softer skills like being able to work in a team, being able to move a project to completion, uh, that sort of thing. So it's, uh, it, it's a part of what I do at least is uh, act as a conduit between what are the needs of the employers and what my, stu my students need to know. Thanks. I think we all have a lot of discussion because we also have Mark from, from IBM and Jim from BNL. So we, we will have a lot of discussion back and forth. So maybe next I'd like to invite Vladimir. Can you talk about oh. what uh, related to quantum that you do every day? I mean, in the, fall, in the spring, I was teaching graduate course on quantum information, but I guess we'll talk about this later. And right now, currently, my main research is within the C2QA grant. I concentrate my efforts currently on two different directions, quantum dynamics, um, which, I don't know, in classical case, everybody knows that the entropy has to increase and then saturate, but quantum entanglement entropy can decay in time or even oscillate like time crystals. 
of this one project another more narrow subject um, in one dimension, some spin chains can be solved analytically by some method which was designed by Hans Bird, it's called Beta Ansatz. And right now, people, including me, trying to input this into a quantum computer. So quantum computer, how to formulate quantum Beta Ansatz inside of quantum computer. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So maybe I'd like to invite Jim next. Uh, Jim, let me see. He's right. muted. He's muted. He's okay, muted. thank you. Yeah, I, I muted because of a phone call that came in, and then I couldn't uh. unmute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, to answer the question, uh, I am, uh, I've been the organizer, as you mentioned, of the Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage. Uh, we've spent a lot of the last year getting organized, standing that up. Uh, a number of folks uh, on this panel uh, are are part of that. Vladimir just spoke about that. Mark, Mark Ritter and his colleagues at IBM. Uh, so we have 24 institutions that are all working on this. And uh, we have three thrusts in our organization, uh, a materials thrust, a devices thrust, and a software and applications thrust. And what I do on a daily basis, uh, uh, I'm trying to get our materials capabilities at Brookhaven aligned with the research of the uh, of the uh, co-design center, and so I think uh, Zuchi, you already had mentioned at the beginning that this is a multidisciplinary uh, effort, and I couldn't agree more. I would say it's an interdisciplinary effort. the The key is getting people from different backgrounds to work together. And uh, my favorite example is, um, uh, uh, you know, the, we've been focusing on superconducting devices. So these are niobium or aluminum based, uh, but we had a chemist who had suggested a new material. And uh, this chemist is not a quantum information scientist at all. Uh, you know, this is a pure, pure classical chemist but boy, he had a good idea. And as a result of that, we've discovered a new material that is making much better properties, you know, longer lifetimes because it has better oxides. And so I think that's a really good illustration of the type of thing that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help build those bridges between disciplines. That's what I'm doing on a daily basis. And, you know, Vladimir's part of our theory and applications, our software and applications team. And there, we're, I'm trying to help build a bridge between the uh, theoretical physicists who have real problems that they're trying to solve with quantum, uh, but they have to be introduced to error mitigation uh, approaches. And so there are bridges that have to be made all over the place. And if I'd say one thing, my daily business is I'm a bridge builder. I'm trying to help people talk across these, uh, across these disciplines. Thank you. That's a wonderful bridge builder. I'm also benefit from, from your leadership at the C2QA. And so next I'd like to invite maybe CR to talk about um, your everyday job and how you're related to quantum. Yeah, thank you, Suchi. Um, so uh, I'm, among the whole panel, uh, I probably have the least exposure to quantum. I, uh, I came into quantum computing thanks to Two of the panelists here, Vladimir and Suche, who used to come to the CS department and kind of proselytize, <laughs> saying that this is an interesting problem. You guys should get excited about it and work on it. And it'd be kind of uh, sitting back saying, oh, what's new? What's new? And then finally, we kind of caught on to it. And I think um, so I have now taken up the mantle of being the quantum evangelist in my department, um, trying to get as many faculty kind of hooked onto this as possible. Uh, there are very, very interesting, challenging problems here. Um, that are uh, very much like traditional computer science problems, but with a slightly different flavor. Um, so it's 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 so it, it's important to find problems where people can ramp up uh, based on their background and work on something new. And uh, so that is my daily job. There are there are a few aspects of this that I would like to elaborate. One is um, on the st student side. Um, so now we have four students who came into the CS department with no idea of what is quantum computing, uh, who are actually working on topics that are uh, QC research at this point. Um, so we kind of, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting experience to see them train themselves 
to 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 work on this area. Uh, on the other side, we are also trying to build up faculty strength. Um, and so the other part of what I do day to day is to figure out what are the areas of faculty strength that we need in quantum computing, and how do we make sure that we hire the right right set of people who will guide us through that. Thank you, Sia. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Mark to speak. Sure. Hi. Uh, my day-to-day -day work that involves quantum computing is uh, managing research projects that actually are in Zurich, in IBM Yorktown, and in Almaden, uh, looking at everything from creating bond-by-bond -bond chemical reactions with scanning tunneling microscopes and understanding the physics and uh, chemistry of those, and, and in fact, some of the theorists want to work with these experimentalists and try to model these things uh, to work on topological materials uh, for semiconductors or for quantum computing for topologically protected quantum bits, uh, as well as looking at uh, using atoms to accurately sense uh, like doing ESR at the atomic scale, that's done in Almaden, electron spin resonance at the atomic scale, uh, and also to look for spin liquids, a new, a new type of um, spin state in these, uh, in these atomic collection of uh, uh, man-made atomic uh, uh, grid of atoms that you put down with STM. So all these types of projects look at different aspects of, of quantum states or quantum matter. Uh, and, and many of it, uh, much of it is aimed at quantum computing, but some of it's just aimed at semiconductors and new materials. Uh, so you see there's a wide range of things, and I've mentioned all of them, uh, that IBM does uh, research on. As well in the team with the C2QA, and I really have appreciated working with Jim and the others on the C2QA. Uh, our team at IBM is involved more in the error correction coding where we have a number of real experts in the world uh, on like Sergey Brady and others that uh, have created codes and the thought in the center is to, to find codes that are more efficient, uh, that don't have as much overhead and yet uh, allow us to get to advantage or being able to compute something with either higher precision or, or less cost of time or energy than a traditional computer. So I'm juggling lots of things as well. There's these uh, national uh, uh, discussions uh, at, in the National Quantum Initiative Advisory Committee, and that's kind of ramping up again. Uh, but there, there are various uh, I would call them more national and uh, systemic and not technical issues of quantum computing being discussed. I'm also on the board of the National Research Council of Canada's quantum uh, advisory board. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think that uh, there is a need that there is international cooperation on these very difficult research topics. And so uh, I've been uh, one in that National Quantum Initiative uh, Committee who is pushing for that international collaboration with uh, people that, that, uh, that respect the same intellectual property laws that the US does. So that's, that's kind of a summary. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for the panelists and how they ask also as a bridge builders in, in different direction of QIS. So I think the, the goal of this panel is try to get ideas and then maybe ask each other, how can we collaborate with one another to build a big or bigger quantum research and development enterprise? So we have to look at from various perspectives, for example, graduate, uh, education and industry needs and lateral NAV research and needs. So maybe let me start with uh, education. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe ask um, Bob, Vladimir and CR to comment on the current status in uh, education, perhaps education program in quantum information science and technology. 
and what are your respective experiences in teaching and training graduate students? So maybe we start with Bob, and I also know you, you are leading the master program. You could also comment on that. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Tijia. Uh, let me start with saying something about uh, PhD education. Uh, I think we started turning out quantum PhDs maybe 15 years ago. Then in Wisconsin, uh, we noticed maybe eight to 10 years ago uh, that the people who had uh, research experience in quantum uh, were getting picked up very quickly and at quite high salaries. Uh, and this suggested to us that demand for these people exceeds supply. And I think that's still true. It's borne out by, let's say, uh, listening to job openings and still the salaries and so forth. And so I think it's very, uh, it's very important uh, that the U.S. government does something. And in fact, they have been doing things. We've already mentioned the National Quantum Initiative has more recently been the National uh, Innovation Competitiveness Act that, that put real money into graduate training, uh, particularly the PhD level. So I'm hopeful that this will actually bring demand and supply into a closer balance at, at, at that level. The MS level, as you say, is the one I'm actually more uh, familiar with. Um, and there, the situation is uh, less clear. It's evolving much quicker. The point is that as companies move from pure research to research and development, even product development, then MS degrees uh, will become more important. You're going to need more lab technicians. Uh, you're going to need people who can do software support for quantum things. Uh, there's the technical side of sale, project management, and so on. And this suggests that the master's degree is also going to be increasingly important. And uh, this is confirmed by projections from the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, who surveyed employers. Um, and uh, they say that there would be an increasing need for master's uh, programs. So Wisconsin, we started a couple of years ago. Um, we've turned out uh, two classes now of master's degrees. And, and this year, we've been joined by a number of other institutions. I know at least of UCLA, uh, USC, Duke, um, University of Rhode Island, Colorado School of Mines all will be uh, taking in master's uh, students this year uh, for the first time. So um, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, uh, part of the workforce development is the, is the production of master's degrees. Uh, so my own experience, uh, as I said, we've, we've turned out two classes now. The first uh, class had six graduates, uh, it was in 2020. We just graduated 11 more last week. Um, it's not, I think, entirely clear yet how, um, uh, how the job market is for these people. Unfortunately, in 2020, of course, we got no information at all because there was no hiring uh, at all because of the pandemic and the effects of that are still clear, are, are still uh, important. Uh, some of our students have gone on to PhDs um, and uh, that, of course, is an attractive option during the, the, pandem the pandemic years. So uh, the, uh, the experience there is not yet. I'm optimistic about the future for our master's uh, graduates. Uh, three of our graduates this year already have jobs in the, in the quantum area. So um, I think this is gonna be an important uh, piece of workforce development going forward. You also asked me about my own experience and uh, what we could have done better. I think the development of uh, softer skills, uh, such as working in a team, uh, completing research projects and so forth. I, I originally conceived the program as mostly a classroom uh, exercise, and that was uh, sort of a mistake. We've, we've had to integrate research into the program in a big way, sort of on the fly. Uh, I, I think that's been reasonably successful so far. So to other people who are thinking about starting master's programs, make sure that you, you pay close attention to people getting practical experience in research. Um, well, let, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. We, we actually at Stony Brook, we are also planning to, to launch a master program. Hopefully next fall, we could learn a lot from, from your experience. Great. Uh, but let me uh, turn to Vladimir. I think um, Vladimir, you have taught quantum information science graduate class for a while and have trained PhD students. Maybe we can hear from you some experience. Can I share my screen? I'll try to share my screen. Sure. Share screen in here, share. 
Um, I was teaching a uh, graduate uh, course on quantum information for a while, but just I want to mention um, maybe a little bit to, to talk about on behalf of the whole State University of New York, which is very large, as you know. So um, in Buffalo, in, in State University of New York in Buffalo, we have the two courses, Vasily Perivenos and Huidong Hu. They teach quantum information for engineers and material science. That's a website. Here in Stony Brook, we have several courses. Professor Wei, Ramakrishnan, Predrag Kristic, and me, I also teach um, those courses. Each of these courses individually is good, but they need to be connected. Actually, in each course, people speak their own language, and those should be unified by us, by teachers. Um, so maybe I just try to move to the next. Oops. Somehow, okay, let me somehow get stuck. Can you use your cursor? There's an arrow maybe on the road. Yeah. Okay. So the course, um, in my view, uh, the graduate course should um, kind of include the standard features. Some of them are uh, enumerated here. I mean, they included uh, in my course. Uh, also, I teach one semester, but I feel that maybe this should be extended. But except of these standard features, which everybody, all of the panelists know, of course, the graduate course each year should be updated, uh, in my view. Uh, so we should uh, include maybe in the end of the course, the latest development, new hardware, new software. Um, just maybe it will make course more interesting. Um, in my view, uh, the important part of the course should be programming. Uh, Qiskit, we should organize like kind of a regular lectures on Qiskit. I'm not so sure, but maybe some experiments should be included in quantum optics and sort of state. Um, well, the course should be collaboration between physics, computer science and engineering. Actually, some mathematics also should be included because topological quantum computation based on model of functors. And I mean, in our math department, we have a, actually the chairman of the department wrote a book about those model of functors. But in my view, some mathematics should be included. Of course, quantum chemistry, it, it was mentioned already several times. Let me, uh -huh. um, of course, the students uh, will be, our students after graduation will be looking for a job. So maybe we should establish some kind of certification. So the students who graduated from us should get some kind of a certificate for, in order for them to get a job. Um, actually on September 22nd, C2QA will have a job fair. So maybe students will be interested in this. Of course, uh, we should also uh, emphasize diversity and inclusion in our courses. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Vatimir. You have covered a lot of things that we we should uh, come back and, and discuss. Of course. Um, maybe, uh, can I ask to stop sharing? Um, wait, 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 mute participant, oh, stop share. Yeah, and then I maybe, yeah, because um, yeah, education in quantum information science is also becoming more and more interdisciplinary. So maybe I'd like to ask CR, what's your view of how with computer science, um, how well you do, or what do you need from uh, physics side to to help uh, gearing up the computer science effort in quantum information? Yeah. Um, so the the current state is um, currently we are at a, 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 a it's a it's a it's a I would describe it as an infancy, right? So we we really haven't developed. Um, we have individual courses, as Vladimir said. We need to kind of put them together to kind of holistic program. And the easiest place to put this together is at a kind of graduate level because we admit students we, uh, of, of a known material. They have been already trained in various areas. We can kind of mold them um, in, in different ways. Um, so in, in, in our case, currently, the students that we uh, are, are working on, um, we are working on quantum computing, uh, they are all CS trained students. They, they don't have much of an exposure to the uh, the, the quantum information side of the world. And we basically go through uh, uh, papers and lectures and courses to go through uh, to get them up to speed. And since they are mature students, we kind of hope that they will pick up stuff by osmosis and move on. Okay, so in, in terms of program, uh, it is the simplest thing to do because we can just say, here's the material, go uh, uh, 
uh, you, you, can, you can figure things out. And here we're going to work on an interesting research problem, and there are parts that you're going to learn on the way while we are working on it. Okay. The more difficult uh, programs are going to be at the undergraduate um, level because we need to kind of really structure them very well. Um, that is probably where we can actually get most bang for the buck because these are the students who are uh, really not completely siloed into areas yet. Uh, so we don't need to kind of break them and then make them. Uh, we, can, we can mold them directly from where they are. Uh, we have, for instance, dual major students, uh, physics and CS, and these are prime candidates for making them into a kind of specialization in quantum, uh, quantum science um, and build strength that way. I think that is... That is the uh, that is a place where I would like to focus a little more attention on on um, getting a little more quantum information science into the undergrad programs, giving them tokens of certificates there, either a specialization or some kind of a post back certificate or something else, uh, where they can uh, get credentials for uh, doing this inter inter interdisciplinary work. Thanks, Sia. I think we could also learn from other institutions uh, established uh, computer science effort in quantum computing. But we can discuss that later. I, next, I'd like to uh, maybe consult Jim and then ask him uh, a couple of questions. So maybe the first one is, what is the current landscape in pursuing research and development of QIST in, in BNL or, or maybe in general national lab? Could you comment on that? Sure. Um but before I do that, Suchi, let me let me just add a comment uh, uh, based on the last discussion that I was thinking while uh, CR was talking. Um, the it might be helpful to think about, uh, and this is kind of the way I think about quantum information science, um, and it's the way we design C two QA. We think about the full stack. And by that, I mean, you know, at the very bottom, you've got to have a material, you know, for the solid state that we're working on, it's superconducting. And then you go up through devices, you go to uh, uh, architecture uh, applications. And uh, if you think about the stack there, are, and you think about, uh, uh, you know, the, the future workforce and education, there, there, there are very few people that really go all the way across the stack. In fact, I know nobody that goes completely across the stack from top to bottom. But I it mean is does. It, it, well, <laughs> an individual part. An individual part. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, yes, I know IBM does, but I'm talking about an individual. And so, I uh, one of the things that I guess I was observing is that. You know, you look at some of the people that, that are around here, like Suchi and, and Vladimir, they're bringing physics applications in, and they're looking for quantum advantage. Um, you know, there are true computer scientists that are working in our center that are looking at, you know, gee, how do we design things so that we can make more efficient error correction type of things? You look at the device people, they're trying to do error mitigation on chip. You look at uh, the materials people, they're trying to improve the defects and things like that. And uh, uh, I guess I'm just pointing out that you can contribute uh, uh, in a horizontal layer that is very important to this vertical stack. And I just wanted to make that observation that it's really hard to know absolutely everything from top to bottom. Uh, and I know of no individual that goes all the way from materials to, uh, 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 you know, the applications. But uh, one of the things that I think is important as we develop that workforce is we have to, we have to translate for people and get people communicating. Uh, one of the things that we're finding is just getting people to understand each other and get a common language is very important. So although you can come into that stack at many, many levels, I think it's incumbent upon us to try to figure out a way to, to have better communication at, at all levels, at least two adjacent layers on the, uh, on the stack. Now, getting back to your original question, what is the landscape? And I'll, I'll briefly mention that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I won't give a full federal landscape, obviously, but I, uh, I'll say what I've observed as a DOE uh, person. Well, I'm not a DOE person. I work at a national lab that's run by the DOE, but I'm uh, a contractor like uh, most uh, national labs. Um, so in my observation of DOE from inside a national lab, um, 
I, I see that DOE has is, is really evolved a lot over the last few years. I remember being at the very first roundtable that DOE had on quantum, and it's only a few years ago, and it was after a VSAC meeting. Um, that's a basic energy science advisory committee meeting. Um, you know, DOE did, wasn't quite sure what to do or where to go. And in fact, at that time, DOE was investing a lot in material science. And, you know, we were looking at things, Mark mentioned topological materials. Uh, uh, we, we were looking at, you know, spin chains, all sorts of things that had potential. Uh, but DOE really then crystallized around a, a, uh, a need to invest in quantum, that there, there was a lack. And, you know, it was, it was not only computing, it was quantum sensing, which is very important to the high energy physics community, quantum communication, um, which is important for a lot of reasons. And uh, what's, what it's resulted in, in the last year, there are five new quantum information science centers, uh, very large centers. Um, you know, they're each funded at $115 million. Um, and they each bring together a very interdisciplinary team. And uh, it is a major effort to uh, understand the limitations, transcend the limitations, uh, and to hopefully develop a domestic workforce and to accelerate the domestic, the domestic industry. And, you know, I'm, I'm very delighted that, for example, uh, IBM is our partner. Uh, you know, Mark's got his C2QA background on. I've got a different C2QA background. I've got IBM right here, Mark. Um, <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> uh, and Stony Brook right here, uh, Tsuji, yeah. Vladimir. Um, the, I, I, I think it's really important that uh, we do things a little bit differently. And the DOE has recognized it because to, this is the first time that I've seen multiple parts of the Office of Science coming together. So we're funded not just by BES or Oscar, all parts of DOE have, have come together. And, you know, this is sort of new. Uh, uh, it, it's a, I think it underscores the importance that the DOE sees in this. Now, let me just finalize, let, let me add why. why. Why is DOE interested? And if you look at the DOE mission, uh, and DOE is a mission-driven organization. A lot of the challenges that DOE faces are really intractable classically. And so they are looking for quantum advantage. Uh, we're not sure where it exists right now, to be quite honest. That's part of our research. Uh, but, you know, some of my colleagues uh, are interested in quantum chromodynamics, uh, looking, in, looking at deep and elastic scattering. These are issues that are very important. For example, uh, you know, the electron ion collider here at Brookhaven, you know, one of the newest federal investments is going to be in a giant electron microscope to look inside the nucleus. We want to look at quarks and gluons. And uh, uh, this is going to involve uh, deep and elastic scattering and an understanding of quantum chromodynamics on a deeper level. And so we're looking for quantum advantage. Some of my colleagues are, are looking at that, but it's not only there. Uh, I know uh, Tsuchi is looking for quantum advantage for some of the condensed matter problems that we're, that we're interested in, quantum chemistry. So they're, they're real drivers. And uh, uh, that's just in the quantum computation end. Uh, networking is important and sensing. Uh, I answered a question on the uh, chat about, about sensing. Um, you know, if you look at high energy physics and, um, you know, the question that I had in the chat was about uh, medical, uh, building a bridge to medical. And there, uh, you know, a very local example at Brookhaven, we're looking at quantum techniques for x-ray scattering where we can reduce the flux on very sensitive samples. And we're hoping to be able to uh, uh, probe things in a way that allows us to do the type of you know, highly precise X-ray scattering that can give us really precise atomic structure of things like binding of drugs to proteins, which is important for things like fighting COVID. That's one of our signatures at Brookhaven. Our macromolecular crystallography beam lines have helped Pfizer and other companies to uh, uh, in the fight against uh, uh, COVID-19. And so can we be more sensitive 
And then if you look at the massive calculations that we've been doing of the binding of drug to proteins, um, I see there is a potential advantage for quantum down the road uh, if we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, achieve the precision in quantum chemistry that we'd like to and the speed up the scaling in quantum chemistry. You know, one of our publications that came out just this week from C2QA was how to speed up quantum chemistry by four orders of magnitude. We still can't do it, but we're closer now because of that. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to also ask a follow up. So what is the need of quantum workforce in National Lab and how could university help? Oh, well, we have, uh, we have a wide spectrum of needs. Um, and so we have needs, I'll go back to that stack that I was talking about. We have needs all the way across that stack. Uh, now at Brookhaven, we happen to have very, very good material scientists and we're blessed with amazing facilities. The National Synchrotron Light Source 2 was a billion and a half dollar investment by the Department of Energy. And it is the, um, it is the brightest beam line, uh, synchrotron beam line, uh, uh, synchrotron photon source in, in the United States right now. And uh, uh, it's world leading in, in energy resolution and spatial resolution. Uh, we have amazing materials capabilities and now what I'm trying to do is understand what the materials challenges are in the quantum information world and use those tools to get better insight so how we can make better, better devices ultimately. So I'm looking at that interface between the materials and the devices. And in this case, we're looking at superconducting devices. How do we make new materials? How do we make better materials? What are the role of defects? What is the source of some of the noise that is limiting the performance of our computers? What proxies can we have on materials that allow us to determine if a material is going to be great for a device or lousy for a device without having to go through all the trouble to make a device to know if it's going to be better or not. You know, so we're looking at these proxies and I'll give an example of what I mean. Uh, we're making resonators as a quick way uh, and measuring the Q of a resonator tells us if that material has potential for a quantum device. And that's a material proxy that, that will tell us something. Uh, there is a uh, resistance ratio in superconducting materials, which also we've discovered is a proxy. If that's good, we have potential for a better device. And we need to do that so we could screen materials more quickly. That's one end. At the other end, I'm looking for people, uh, and we have a lot of people at the lab who've got fundamental physics and chemistry and material science problems that need to learn quantum computing capabilities. We need to translate some of these problems. So I have a need at that level. And frankly, where I don't have many people right now, but I'd like to for the future is in that middle level. And that is, I'd like to have people here making devices also so that we can better understand how to interact with, uh, with companies like IBM down the road. So I'm looking for people all across that stack, frankly. Thank you, Jim. So that's a lot of things that uh, we need to, from the educator side, how we can build this stack into the education system. But before we start doing that, let me ask Mark uh, his opinion on the need of uh, quantum workforce from industry and how university can, can help. Well, we already are hiring people, of course, into our quantum program. And uh, we uh, have seen that there are certain groups already that have excellent students uh, that have been trained in quantum computer science or in uh, the theoretical quantum science, including some uh, computer science aspects, as well as in experimental quantum science, like some of the people that are in the C2QA consortium, like like Yale or Princeton or, or MIT, many of these schools. To me though, uh, what, what uh, others here have said, Bob and, and, and the others have emphasized is the need that we see going ahead in the future is much larger. There, there already uh, is 
a need that I would say is greater than can be filled, not just in people working on the, the fundamental quantum technologies, but also some of the, what I would call ancillary technologies that will support quantum technologies. Uh, for example, advanced lasers uh, that are at strange wavelengths for our ion-based quantum computing that don't exist now, and they also have to be incredibly stable they have different characteristics than previous communication technology lasers. And you can go down a whole list of many, many uh, uh, ancillary technologies, as well as these fundamental technologies. So there's lots of need for materials, uh, for basic physics, for device physics and engineering, as well as for the um, algorithmic and application development, applying these quantum technologies, whether it be to sensing, to computing, and of course to communication, it's going to employ uh, probably very heterogeneous technologies in my mind. Uh, and I had already answered partially in the questions, a, a question about quantum networking, but without a repeater, which means some device that takes the flying qubit, which is just a photon, with some encoding on the polarization. Of course, there's a quantum no cloning algorithm, meaning you can't actually measure it without destroying it. And so all you can do is swap it. There, there is a, a process where you can swap that state into the state of something locally in your switch and then uh, route it, that is switch it to the output based on some classical information, say, and then you can swap that state out of your quantum memory into the output port. And that's how quantum repeaters work because you cannot copy the quantum information. You have to do that extremely with extremely high fidelity to make that work. Another way to make it work is just through entanglement like teleportation uh, that Charlie Bennett at IBM and Joe Brossard and others uh, invented this quantum teleportation where through entanglement and classical measurement, uh, you can send an in, entangled photon and a classical measurement of some information at the sending end to a receiving end and reconstruct a quantum state at the receiving end. It doesn't violate no cloning because you destroy the information at the sending end in order to measure these bits, but you reconstruct a quantum state at the receiving end. That's a totally different way. And, and I don't believe that that will work over long distance. But all these technologies that I mentioned, wow, there's lots of science and engineering to do. And there are already jobs. And there are many uh, in the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. I found out there are many companies, small companies, startups, as well as big companies looking at systems. Many of the startups are looking at components that will be used by the bigger system uh, providers. And there, there are a tremendous number of those startups, whether it be in the software realm or hardware ancillary technology or basic quantum technology realm. So I wanna encourage you students that there's a wide range across most of the sciences and engineering of jobs that intersect with quantum technologies and applications. Thank you, Mark. So this is an exciting news also for students mm -hmm. that you have a lot of opportunity that you can work at various different areas that related to quantum and there's a lot of needs. So maybe next I'd like to uh, play Monita's recording. She is going to talk about workforce development so we can maybe uh, watch that for a while and we can come back for other discussion. So let me share the screen. And I'll just play the video in, um, show in the slide mode. And I'll play the video. And it's about it's less than 10 minutes. And we can always come back and discuss. Sorry, let's continue. Zuchi, I don't think we're hearing the audio. Yeah, oh. yeah, uh, I, yeah. Sorry, I think I need to when I yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, Let oh, me. Sorry. Yeah. 
Let me do it again. Of course. Yeah, I apologize. I think when I share screen, I should click share sound. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, let me do this again. I'm Benita London, Professor of Psychology and Director of the Social Processes of Identity, Coping and Engagement Research Lab at Stony Brook University. I'd like to take just a few minutes to share with you the workforce development strategy and conceptual model that was developed in collaboration with our research partners in the New York Center for a Scalable Hybrid Quantum Internet Proposal. As you already, I'm sure, uh, have talked about and explored in this panel, workforce development strategies and activities can be very broad, uh, impacting anywhere from K-12 students who have no knowledge and background in a particular discipline, but maybe they have a budding interest in science that can be nurtured through exposure and role models and, and information all the way to professional development activities for industry partners and scholars who are already at the cutting edge of their science and at the top of their field. Despite the fact that there is such a breadth of activities that are framed as workforce development, there's still really an underlying theme. Uh, any activities that recruit, retain, and advance individuals through a pipeline in a given field. And as you think really specifically about the types of workforce development activities that you might implement in your respective organizations, I think it's not only important to offer just a breadth of activities, but also to know and understand why and how these activities are effective in promoting career motivation, achievement, and confidence, and selecting wisely as a function of understanding how they work. In our workforce development model, we really leveraged uh, empirically grounded theories from social, developmental, and educational psychology, as well as research on organizational climate to address that how and why workforce development activities really work to broaden and increase the pipeline. So we really thought deeply about each of the types of activities that we were already doing um, and have been doing for many years, as well as new and innovative activities that were either in implementation or early implementation stages, and really tried to interrogate uh, what those activities were doing in terms of how they were creating motivation and connection and belonging among students and scholars. And so as a function of that, and looking through the literature in psychology, we really identified three core factors that are really related to success, uh, recruitment, engagement, and advancement in any field, but particularly in the sciences. So those three factors are career identity, which really reflects uh, the investment, the commitment, and the identification that an individual feels to their field of study. How much do I feel like a scientist? Uh, when things become very difficult, as they inevitably do in any field, in any science, people who have a higher identification with that domain are more likely to stick with it. They're more likely to persist even when difficulties emerge. So having an identification with one science is very important for uh, engagement and success in that field. A second concept is career efficacy, which is really the belief and the confidence that I have the skills to be successful in this domain. So it's a combination really of skill development, but also the confidence that you can apply those skills in a way to be successful. And the third concept is institutional belonging. And that reflects the connection, the comfort, the feeling like I'm valued and I'm respected in this organizational space and by the people around me. And again, to the extent that people feel that sense of belonging and connection, they're more likely to be successful and maintain their sense of engagement in that space over time. So these three factors have been studied by psychologists for quite a long time, um, and they are really at the core of what we think all of our workforce development activities are, are contribute, right? Uh, 
Some of them are contributing uh, creating identity. Some of them are contributing a sense of belonging and some of them are contributing uh, efficacy. So in bringing the workforce development activities together, we really try to design and think about them through the lens of these three factors. We also thought about the activities in terms of the target population, activities that represent early pipeline exposure through uh, late career uh, exposure of people who, again, are at the top of their field already. We thought about activities that were implemented in a sort of a network in which scholars can implement different types of activities across different institutions versus activities that are really local and specialized in some way. And we also thought about, again, the strategic focus, the why and the how, which is our career identity, efficacy, and institutional belonging. Just to give you a snapshot of how we sort of organized this framework and thought about this more broadly, this is uh, our uh, workforce development strategic plan and table. And you can see that um, it's organized through the lens of thinking about the kind of impact that each activity has to offer, um, the target population, uh, uh, the psychosocial factor that it addresses, and where that um, activity is located, either centrally located across all institutions or highly specialized in a particular institution. What you also notice in this table is that we also identify activities that um, reflect a broadening participation mission, uh, increasing diversity of the pipeline by targeting populations that have been traditionally underrepresented in this field. And so to give you just a little bit of a closer look, um, when we think about curriculum innovation, the activities that include things like the quantum smart degree program and continuing education programs, those programs are really focused on uh, developing students' skills and efficacy and confidence in their ability to do the science. And so the core concept here is um, how do these uh, curriculum innovations develop efficacy as well as develop identity feeling like a scientist as a function of um, uh, going into educational programs that train you as a scientist. We also grouped uh, experiential training and exposure kinds of activities, quantum boot camps, REU activities, community uh, information labs. Again, all of these are providing a sense of skills and efficacy development. Um, specific skills that students are learning through these boot camps, research mentoring and immersion and talent programs also allow scholars to go into the field and go into different spaces and again develop a sense of confidence and efficacy in their ability to do the science in a real way. And research and industry shadow program um, is an opportunity for scholars to again identify with the science, see how being a quantum scientist in an industry space, what that looks like and, and how to be a scientist in that space. We also uh, thought about recruitment and dissemination, again, particularly around issues of broadening participation of a diverse pipeline of scholars, uh, which includes uh, inclusive excellence, visiting scholar lecture series where scholars will come to campuses to uh, share their science, and also field kinds of campus visits where scholars are going to institutions that may not have access to the same kinds of, of scientific activities and sharing the science in that way. And then finally, we also thought about um, different programs that contribute to uh, belonging. So networking and social engagement programs, including student level organizations, and even this conference where um, uh, scholars and industry partners and students are interacting with each other and developing a sense of connection and, and broader belonging under this umbrella of quantum science. So in, in closing, I just want to uh, highlight the notion that as you're thinking about different types of workforce development activities, 
an important consideration is thinking about why a particular activity fits your organizational uh, capacity and also why that particular activity or how that particular activity is going to impact the scholars or the students that it's applied to. Is it contributing to their identity? Is it contributing to their efficacy and skill development? Is it contributing to their sense of belonging within the field? Okay, yeah, so I like to thank Bonita for sharing her idea. Um, we have a lot of discussion. Um, maybe at this point, I'd like to open to other participants and there are already many uh, question in the chat. So maybe let me go from the beginning. Uh, there's uh, uh, David asking quantum computing, will it actually produce jobs? So uh, I guess it's already hard, but any panel would, would like to comment. Maybe IBM already, <laughs> Mark already, <laughs> already comment on that. Yeah, I believe so. It, it has, and, and we believe that uh, it, the growth in jobs will continue. There are some people and students may have heard of the term quantum winter. <laughs> and it's, a, it's kind of a thought that there could be a time when the promise, uh, people grow tired of the promise and haven't yet seen applications that show advantage. But I'll remind you that we already have many things that are quantum technologies that we use, like atomic clocks are used for certain things already since actually the 1950s. That was one of the first quantum technologies. And, and those clocks will be used more and more as we miniaturize them. Uh, so it, it's not a question about a quantum winter. It's a question about when each of the quantum technologies develops such that a new ecosystem and new products develop. And that will cause new uptake in the number of students required. Uh, right now we're in the research stage and early engineering. So there still are a lot of people uh, required at this point. Uh, and yet they're, they're with COVID and everything, look, nothing's for certain how this all will develop in time. But I think you can be assured that this is an area of physics and engineering that will grow. Thanks, Mark. Um, Jim, you want to comment that the job opportunity uh, already provided at National Lab? Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with Mark. I think uh, the job growth will will continue. Certainly at the National Labs, um, you know, on the research side, we are hiring people throughout the stack. Um, you know, from uh, uh, people on the material side who are interested in new quantum technologies, whether it be things like, you know, topological or spin chain type of uh, uh, capabilities uh, or superconducting all the way up through and including the applications, uh, you know, from uh, uh, theoretical physics, chemistry and uh, material science. Uh, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, there's there's no question that I've, I'm advertising jobs now, <laughs> uh, and I think this is going to continue to grow over over the next uh, over the next years. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I guess there would also be job opportunity at universities, um, and I sincerely hope that uh, the university would hope would open um, widely faculty position in related area. But I think there's also um, individual grant that university can, uh, researcher could offer to hire a student, but uh, I'd like to know comments from maybe other panelists in universities. Well, uh, there was just something else that came into the chat. How many jobs? Um, you know, uh, IBM is a big corporation, but it's only one. Uh, so when people do more comprehensive um, projections, you know, Forbes and so forth, the projections, uh, they talk about this being a $10 billion uh, industry in 10 years or something, uh, something like that. And uh, I don't know, to get the number of jobs, you have to divide by usually 10 to the fifth or some factor like that. So you can work it out yourself. Um, it looks to me like quantitatively, uh, there are going to be uh, a lot of jobs out there, and at least in in relation to the 
you know, the, the pipeline, the, the capabilities that the educational system now has to produce those people. I, I may also add that um, actually Mark is on this Quantum Economic Development Consortium, QEDC, and they have a website listing job opportunity there. So I encourage that you search QED hyphen C and, and see uh, job opportunity. But there is also, an, I think another website has a list of quantum companies. I think it's something like quantum computing report website that you could go and see companies listed there, either startup or, or, or established companies. So um, if there's no other comment from the panel, let me move on to the second one. Uh, George Johnny says, hello, oh, I'm currently pursuing my master's in physics. Can you tell me how much scope do I have in the research aspect of quantum computing and how do I proceed in the research side? So any, any panelists would like to start answering that? Yeah, let, let, let me take a quick crack at this. Um, if if so, so somebody who has uh, specialized in one um, master's degree at this point, uh, it, it depends on exactly which part of the stack you fit in or what, what you want to do, right? It, it, it's it's it, it, quantum computing, as, as Jim has been saying, it goes all the way from uh, base, basic materials to applications. And so it depends on which aspect of physics that you are, you are interested in. But if you want to get into quantum computing in the, the, on the computing side of things, um, the, the thing that we look, I, I think is ideal to get is some kind of fluency. This, this, is a, this is something that um, I had very great difficulty going from computing side to the physics side because when Vladimir would come and write down a few, uh, a few things as to how things work, I, I had to go back home and kind of work it out step by step, uh, each step taking a couple of hours trying to figure out exactly what does this mean, right? So it's, it's, it's a kind of mathematical fluency that you need to operate on. Having a master's in physics, you already have that fluency. It's a computing fluency that you would need to build up. Right, um, and this would need some amount of software development experience. It's not simply programming. Uh, it, again, working in teams, as uh, uh, Bob said, to be able to build a product, to be able to uh, to support a product that has been built out, to be able to configure things. Uh, it, all, all these are skill sets that you would need to bring in. And um, I think going through, um, so that that is what would actually, from my perspective, uh, would 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 um, get you prepared for the quantum computing side. Thanks. Yeah. Any further comment from other panelists? Well, I I, I would simply add that um, uh, there are many subfields that that can be applied, and so if you think about the stack, you can go horizontally and move towards you know how does how does my field contribute to quantum uh, computing somewhere in that stack, and like I said, you, you know. You could think about this, you know, vertical stack that's very, very broad, uh, but you could bring lots of different capabilities to specific problems in the broad quantum information science spectrum. Uh, so I don't think, you know, again, I'm trying to send this message. It's not that you have to be fluent across the entire stack, but you have to know what the, what the quantum issues are in your field. And I would advise people to then try to look at the adjacent parts of the stack as best as possible so that you can communicate with the people immediately above and below you on, on the stack. You know, so for example, if you're a device person, uh, you can come you know, into this very nicely, um, but you may want to think about, for example, the uh, on-chip error correcting possibilities, you know, what ancillas are you going to be uh, contributing to, et cetera. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but you could really focus on moving your, your topic into this, into this area. And because the, the, there's such a broad spectrum of, of issues going across the stack, I think there are lots of opportunities for this horizontal motion into, into quantum. Certainly. 
Um, yeah, so there are a lot of things we, we could not talk about in the interest of time. For example, these uh, not just physicists, computer science, they also quantum engineering. And uh, I know Bob has written a paper, co-authored a paper on quantum, developing a quantum engineering undergraduate program that opened up a lot of things that you could get involved. Um, but let me maybe go to the next questions. Uh, there's one question directed to Jim, but I think Jim already answered that in the chat. But let me just read the question. Any bridge building of quantum application towards medical field? I think this question is related to another question that I just sent in the chat about uh, Stony Brook or C uh, C2Q, uh, BNL research and apply quantum phenomena towards neurology or psychology. Uh, Jim already answered that. Should should I read or Jim, maybe you could uh, briefly summarize your answer? Yeah, why don't I, why don't I briefly summarize? So um, uh, in response to the first part of the question, uh, there are bridges to, uh, to the medical field and um, we're spending a, a fair bit of our effort at Brookhaven, uh, you know, quantum or not, classically also on uh, the problem of biomolecular structural characterization. Um, we're, we're really in the era of, uh, of drug design where understanding the interaction of drugs with proteins, uh, you know, true biomolecular structure determination is, is critical. You know, we've run, we've run incredible numbers of simulations to screen candidates to accelerate the fight against COVID. And then we validate that with the um, macromolecular crystallography you know, with x-rays, if we can make a crystal, we can get incredibly precise structures out of this. There's some things you can't crystallize. And that's where techniques like cryo-electron microscopy have really blossomed um, uh, as a complementary approach. You don't get quite the resolution and there's an enormous inversion problem, but um, you, can, you can get that and we, we are applying both. But the, one of the fundamental problems that we're seeing is, uh, number one, you want to screen all of these. And as I was, you know, discussing earlier, um, you know, there, there's a significant potential for quantum algorithms to accelerate some of, those, some of those searches. But the other aspect of it from an experimentalist point of view is that the high flux of photons, X-ray photons or um, uh, electrons uh, in a cryo-EM situation uh, can damage samples. And uh, so we are using quantum sensing techniques to do more sensitive structural determinations without perturbing the, uh, the system. And so uh, um, there, there are bridges to, uh, to uh, medicine that that we think there, I think I think I I see a lot of these developing. Okay, so uh, uh, that's, there's a second question that I uh, any grant that BNL or Stony Brook research apply quantum phenomena toward neurology or psychology. I, myself, I'm not aware of this, but but it's because I didn't look or yeah. But if anyone knows of any. Uh, research toward quantum phenomena uh, in neurology, maybe can let us know. I, I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, but I would point out that Stony Brook and Brookhaven have a seed grant program. Um, if you have an idea in this area, um, every year there's a competition for seed grant to, to develop uh, some of these. So that's the one grant that I could think of that's broadly based where somebody, if you have an idea, they're highly competitive, obviously, uh, but uh, it might be a way to start uh, in uh, uh, a field like that. Okay, thanks. So th there is uh, another question. Uh, I think Mark answered the question in the chat. It's from Akash Chandra Behera. Given the current landscape of quantum computing and quantum inclusion, when do you think we will see these technologies become viable for use by the end user, especially quantum inclusion? 
And Mark already replied to that. Mark, would, would you like to briefly summarize your answer? Yes, for those not watching the chat, I'll just read what I wrote already and add mm -hmm. a little bit to it. That early quantum encryption technologies can be bought now. There's a company in, in Zurich, Switzerland, that sells uh, quantum encryption in, in links that you can plug into your computer now. I've heard they aren't as stable as one might like, but it's possible. And that uses the BB84 uh, uh, bennett Brassard uh, polarization uh, encrypted uh, quantum uh, uh, encryption. But the thing is, it's point to point. You have to have a fiber connected to one computer and no switch in between that and the receiving computer. So you don't have any links like that, except in your house or special links perhaps. And the distances is, is, can be up to hundreds of kilometers has been demonstrated at low bit rates. Uh, so you see it's, it's, it, uh, it's a nascent technology and that couldn't be used to, uh, to put on the web where we have switches everywhere that look at addresses and forward it on based on the internet protocol, the IP protocol, that doesn't work. And to do that, you need quantum repeaters, which take, as I said before, that flying photon, the single, the single uh, photon that has some encoded quantum information, swap it out uh, to some other memory quantum state, and then swap that back to a new output link to the right the right fiber uh, in your router. That technology is more than 10 years away. And even then, as I said in the, in the reply, you know, it's going to be an expensive technology uh, that won't just be putting a simple card likely in your rack and, and these uh, switch, the, uh, the switches in some telecommunications vault down the street, under the street. It's not going to be that simple. So somehow I don't think even when we create this technology that it's going to be cheap or easy to roll out and create a whole new quantum internet. I think it'll be slow at first building up certain backbones and perhaps uh, expanding it from there. As well, that network will require, I believe, quantum clocks because timing is extremely important for quantum networks because you have to know when that photon's coming. And uh, that changes with temperature, as you'll find out if you've studied the refractive index of materials varies with temperature and wavelength but temperature changes during the day will change the arrival time considerably for long length. So how do you do all that? There have to be all sorts of protocols layered on top to end. There's all sorts of engineering, all sorts of science to do to make these work. And that's why I encourage you students, th there's tremendous amount to be done and, and uh, lots of inventions and ideas to be explored to make these technologies uh, really implementable. And, and quantum memories, Mark. Yep. Uh, I, clock issue. I, I think I, I mentioned the memory in there, but yeah, it's, it's there. You have to transduce into a memory, quantum memory, and transduce it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. So there's, uh, the next question, I'll answer this question. What are the funding sources for education and workforce development? As far as I know, uh, National Fo Science Foundation is in, very interested in, in such education and workforce development. And also there are also other private foundations. So uh, if there are other panels want to add, feel free. But uh, if not, I move on to the next question in the interest of time. This question is directed to CR. Uh, as you mentioned, the undergraduate student can be molded in terms of skill sets in quantum information and computing by introducing specialization. So for a current undergrad student interested in to pursue career in this field, how we can start molding ourselves in present. In other words, can you suggest a foundational topic or skill set we as students should start focusing on? Okay, so this is a um, this is a in, in, in interesting a uh, tough question to answer because currently uh, uh, we we don't we don't have a specialization. We don't know exactly what goes into getting a four year undergraduate program in quantum information science. At least I, I'm not aware of that, mm -hmm. and. Um, so the cu current thing that I, I would advise an undergrad student who is interested in this kind of area to do is to do a double major or a major and a minor. Um, you have to have a foundation in physics. That is the math, that is the foundation for doing anything on this. 
and you have a minor in computer science and that should prepare you reasonably well for a career um, or further, further development. Um, starting out with a major in physics, the mind, major in computer science and minor in physics will be slightly tougher going because the kind of math that we computer scientists are trained to forget is the kind of math that is useful for you to actually pursue in quantum computing. So uh, majoring in physics and doing a minor in CS is probably the right way to approach uh, currently. And uh, I, I'm sure any kind of designed uh, bachelor's program or a post bachelor's program will kind of take this, this, this aspect into account. Thanks, yeah. So maybe we, we should start not forgetting. Uh, but I'd like to ask uh, if Bob have any comment because you have co-authored a paper on quantum engineering program. Uh, well, I think um, actually uh, it, I agree with, uh, with CR that probably uh, if, you're not, if you're not going to do engineering, then um, a concentration in physics is probably the way to go right now. Um, however, we're finding in the master's program that uh, some of the students which are the most marketable uh, turn out to be kind of the other direction, people who have a lot of computer science experience and then come and get you know, a one-year comprehensive introduction to quantum. Um, if you're going to uh, uh, do, do software, for example, uh, you may end up you know, doing software which is supporting uh, a quantum operation. And then actually it's, uh, it's the other parts of software which are the most important, but you have to understand the applications. So I think it can work in a number of different ways. Thanks, Mark. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to ask uh, the organizers to see how we're we doing in time. Should we wrap up? Yeah, I think it's about time to uh, okay. wrap up. So, uh, so maybe, uh, I'm, I apologize that we won't be able to answer all the questions, but maybe uh, I'd like to ask each uh, panelist to just close with some brief remark, about one minute remark um, on the issues or you want to summarize anything uh, for our audience to take home. Let me start with Bob. Well, I think uh, I've been very impressed by uh, things that Jim has said about uh, the whole quantum enterprise really requiring many, many different kinds of inputs. And uh, as he sort of put it, uh, you know, there's a, uh, there's a sort of breadth of, uh, that's required, a horizontal part, but then there's the vertical part where you have uh, uh, people with different skills and all of these people need to talk to each other as I think uh, Vladimir also, also emphasized. So it's going to be a very interesting future, uh, very interdisciplinary and involves uh, a lot of effort, people just getting together and being able to uh, collaborate and learn how to talk to one another. Thanks, Bob. Uh, maybe Vladimir? Um, I first fully agree with Bob. I think we should start teaching quantum mechanics in the high school and continue in undergraduate, master, and then graduate. Among other things, I think maybe we should be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, like in the university, we have other departments. Take math department. They have very good uh, uh, courses in topology. Everybody knows topology. There's no courses in quantum mechanics. Maybe they mm -hmm. should include that in their course. Okay, maybe I should stop on this aggressive note. <laughs> Thanks, uh, CR? Yeah. Um, so I, I will summarize the work in front of us as some kind of, we want to be able to increase diversity across multiple dimensions. Um, there is a, it, this field has the inherently built-in diversity in terms of disciplines, um, the, the kind of stack that we have. Um, and also we, we, need, we need to build our programs within a diverse array of um, educational levels, at, at bachelor's, at high school, at master's level and, and so on. But we should not forget that um, this if, if I see quantum uh, uh, computing as an intersection between engineering and, and, and physics and computing, these three disciplines are uh, woefully backward in terms of uh, gender and ethnic, ethnic diversity. 
And um, we, we should design programs in such a way that we increase that diversity while we build an inter interdisciplinary program. I think this, this is important. Thanks, Sia. Uh, maybe I ask Jim to, to provide his closing comment. Sure, and, and I'd just like to convey a certain sense of excitement about the field and about this interdisciplinary interaction. And I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that with a little anecdote. Uh, Steve Gervin, who uh, uh, was our founding director for C2QA, well known in the field, uh, loves quantum devices, a theoretical physicist. One of the things that he's truly excited about, he is talking for the first time in his career with computer scientists. And, you know, there, there's this massive language barrier that was that had to be overcome and it's still being overcome. But, you know, good goodness, uh, the the excitement in Steve and the, the fun that he's having uh, and it's leading to really interesting new ideas. Uh, so, yeah, there's a barrier. There's a language barrier, uh, you know, when you talk to the adjacent fields. But I, I'm seeing a lot of people getting really excited about that. And I'm seeing that all across the stack, as I like to talk about. So I, I just wanted to convey to folks, I think there is a tremendous excitement. There's a barrier to be overcome in, in communication often. Uh, but boy, it's well worth it's well worth going though there because I think there are some exciting things that are going to be happening. Mark, your closing remark. Sure, I I, it's, I have another call, so I'm going to make this very brief. Uh, <laughs> te teams that accomplish a lot are always multidisciplinary, and have people poking on them with a different viewpoint, using different thoughts. It's so important and you need to learn, if anything, to work together with people that just think differently than you do and value that. Uh, I think that's the encouragement I have for you. And I've seen that a lot at IBM uh, with, with computer scientists interacting with physicists and, and learning how to communicate <laughs> and various uh, people across the spectrum. It's very important that you learn to do that and not think that you're particular subfield has all the answers uh, because it's so important to keep that open mind and really be able to explore things from a different direction. So I encourage you to do that and learn how to work in that way. Oftentimes our education, I remember mine, it gets very focused on what your research topic is. <laughs> and you need to broaden out beyond that some in your discussions with uh, colleagues that are doing different types of research. Start doing that now, just talking to them and help develop that way of interacting and appreciating other areas of research. That's what I would encourage you to do. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists for a very exciting and interesting and uh, discussions and this is really a multidisciplinary discussions and we hope we can continue more but I would like to hand back the time to Dimitri. Okay so thank you very much uh, the uh, panel and uh, to chair for this uh, really uh, informative and uh, inspiring conversation uh, for sharing your uh, insights and uh, knowledge this was tremendously uh, useful. Uh, let me also thank all uh, lecturers, uh, the uh, organizing team, but uh, above all the uh, participants. So especially uh, those of you who are now with us and who stayed uh, till the end, we already received uh, a lot of uh, very useful uh, feedback uh, from you. And basing on this feedback, we are considering the possibility of making it a regular annual event so please uh, provide us uh, more uh, of your uh, thoughts and advice on uh, how to do it better. Uh, so thank you all. And with this, I declare the event uh, closed.